Hi, everyone. I'm Ruthie Fierberg, and I am thrilled to welcome you to another brilliant edition of Second Stream here at Second Stage. I am an arts journalist based here in New York, former executive editor at Playbill, and the current creator and host of Why We Theater on the Broadway Podcast Network. I am so excited for another dynamic conversation tonight. We are here to welcome playwright Rajiv Joseph and director May Adralis. For those of you who don't know, Rajiv is an Obie Award-winning playwright, as well as a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Drama. He got his start here at Second Stage uh, when his second professional play, Animals Out of Pay, oh, I'm sorry, second professional play, All This Intimacy, um, premiered Uptown in 2004, followed up by Animals Out of Paper, which we are going to talk about tonight as it is the precursor to Letters of Suresh. You may also know him from Gruesome Playground Injuries, Bengal Tiger at the Baghdad Zoo, extremely accomplished. Please welcome Rajiv Joseph. And joining him tonight, we have director May Adralis, who was just recently promoted to artistic director at the Lark Theater. Welcome May, she is an award-winning director, has done fellowships, had her early start at second stage, um, and together they are embarking on Letters of Suresh. So welcome to Rajiv and May. We're so excited to have both of you here. Thanks, Ruthie. Yeah, thank you. Glad to be here. So this show, little, to, little known to the rest of us, was going to premiere in the fall of 2020. Obviously plans have changed, um, but the play is just as gorgeous as I'm sure it was during that first early reading. Rajiv, I wanna start with you because as I was mentioning in your introduction, this is a play that kind of spins out from animals out of paper. What called you to revisit the character of Suresh, this origami prodigy? that now we're re-encountering. Yeah, well, you know, Animals on a Paper was produced about uh, a little over 10 years ago um, at Second Stage at the McGinn Casal Theater. And um, it was, um, you know, a, a really important play for me in my like professional development and also in the, you know, how it, um, how it was received at that time. And I really thought about, um, I think it was a few years later, I was, um, I was on a subway train in New York, um, going to visit a friend who had been out of the country for several years, and she had not been able to see any of my plays at that point. And I had just published a little book that had three of my published plays in it, mm. one of the animals on a paper. And so on the subway, I was just started flipping through that play again, reading it, and then suddenly I just wondered, like I was like, I wonder whatever happened to Suresh. You know, he was this eighteen-year-old kid who had gone through some stuff and was clearly a genius and um, had interesting thoughts about the world. And I just started wondering who he had become. And mm. that's what I did this play. Okay, so without spoiling too much, I, I do wanna set the scene a little bit for folks. Um, Letters of Suresh begins with a new character named Melody who had not been in Animals Out of Paper. And she discovers 10 letters that Suresh wrote to her uncle who is a priest in Japan. And Melody, Melody decides to write to Suresh. And so we learn about him through her letters. And bonus, if you saw Animals Out of Paper, then you really know Suresh as that 18 year old um, origami prodigy. I mean, the entire play, like you said, you so you were re-examining Suresh, but it comes out of this one moment that's mentioned in Animals Out of Paper, where he was at this origami convention, he's folding, and all we know in Animals Out of Paper is that a man begins to cry. So ha like, had that moment always stood out to you, Rajiv, or was it only in rereading it that suddenly that's the thing that jumped out. It wasn't that moment that jumped out at me. Um, and I will say that like, you know, hopefully anyhow, you don't need to have be familiar with Animal on a Paper to- No, play. it's just a bonus. It's just a bonus yeah. if you are. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing is, is that when I wrote Animal on a Paper, it almost entirely takes place in a woman's apartment in Boston. But there's this one scene and the ingenious set by Beowulf Borat 
uh, folded. And just like origami, the set folded out and suddenly we went from this apartment in Boston to a hotel room in Nagasaki in Japan, where this um, international origami convention was where our two characters find themselves. And that was like one of those also those kind of delightful moments as a playwright when you're like, oh, in this scene, I can just go to Japan. Like, it's just, we're just gonna call it Japan. And now we're in Japan. <laughs> one of the beautiful things about storytelling is that you just move around the world without, you know, a second thought. And- That's so true. Yeah, and my, because I it was Nagasaki, um, my uncle saw the play. My uncle is a Catholic priest. And his uncle, my great uncle, was also a Catholic priest. And that great uncle of mine was a chaplain in the US military during World War II. And so my uncle, uh, who is still alive, gave me this beautiful black and white picture. Uh, beautiful is the wrong word, troubling um, picture of mm -hmm. my great uncle standing with three little Japanese kids in the ruins of a church in Nagasaki about nine months after the end of the war. And the American troops had gone in there to aid with the sort of um, uh, rehabilitation of the city. And my uncle told me this story that he had gone to this church and he had cleared the rubble off of an altar there and, um, and said mass for the soldiers and some of the people in the neighborhood. Um, and I thought that was really intense. And, um, and I kept the picture hanging on my wall for many years. And then when I started to revisit you know, the story of Suresh, I was drawn to that one scene in Nagasaki. So I really looked at that. And then I actually visited Nagasaki and um, found this church, which still exists. And, um, and it was like this, and being in that city, which is a gorgeous city, um, really uh, shifted something in me, uh, you know, emotionally and spiritually. And I think that um, I went there knowing I was gonna write this play, but not knowing really what the play was about. I was gonna kind of let the spirit guide me. And, um, and so as I, I, as I looked closer and closer at that, that one scene from Animal Letter Paper that takes place in Nagasaki, I started pouring through it for clues, um, clues that I had left not knowing I had left them. And there's this one mention of a man at the hypocenter, the hypocenter is the place where the bomb exploded over in Nagasaki, who had started to cry when, when Suresh was folding a piece of origami. And I just started wondering, well, who's that guy? And that is the priest, Father Hashimoto, who um, is, you know, is the, the person who Suresh has been writing his letters to. I am absolutely mesmerized by that story of the genesis of this, of how, you know, because I was going to ask you, like, when did the crying man become a priest, become Father Hashimoto? And here it is, like, I can almost, I mean, obviously I've never seen this photo, but I can sort of picture the emotion in it and like the Joseph family history that is now embedded in this play. Wow. Wow. Woo. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> I mean, May, I want to talk to you because hearing this, I, I'm, I'm just so moved by it and I could see why anyone would want to get their hands on the play. My understanding is that you and Rajiv have known each other for a while, never worked together, but that it was Carol Rothman at Second Stage who saw this early reading of Rajiv's new play and said, what about Mayadralis for this? So what was it to you that you found inside it that called to you as a director that you wanted to get your hands on it? Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, when the opportunity came for this play, I mean, my, I, I was so excited. I, I actually really jumped up and down because I've always wanted to work with Rajiv. Um, and I've always wanted to, I, I love working at Second Stage. Um, so it means so much that, uh, you know, Carol suggested me for this. Um, the play, I, I, I've been, uh, I, I love Rajiv's work. I've, I've uh, you know, been an avid fan for many, many years uh, since we first met at the Lark. Um, and I find um, with each play that I read of his that I start to understand um, much more about um, my own humanity, uh, so much more about, um, 
the, the many, many passages one goes through in life, you know, a, a, any kind of rebirth or and loss and grief um, and change. And so I really um, have always felt when, I, when I've when i had had the opportunity to work on any of this, his, his work, I feel um, that, that it really opens up a part of myself as a person. And so this play was no exception. Um, this play in particular, um, it, it always moves me in so many different ways and push and pull ways when I read it. Um, my first, when I, when I read it, um, I guess in 2019, I was struck because I had just cleaned out my childhood home uh, mm -hmm. that I grew up in. And in doing that, um, I uncovered a series of journals and also just stacks and stacks and stacks of letters. Um, so one of the, this play, um, you know, it's the, the form, you know, takes place in letters. Um, and so that um, immediately resonated with me. But one of the things that um, just completely, <laughs> it, it just felt uh, so serendipitous to be working on this play is that um, as I was cleaning out my room, I realized I had all of these letters that I'd, I had, had written to, um, to God, like all of my prayers were basically written to God. I grew up in a very uh, religious, had a very religious childhood. And so, um, and I was able to uncover this part of myself from years and years and years ago, <laughs> you know, because I'd been keeping these journals since I was 11 or 12. And then uh, as I was reading them, I, I started to just see, um, you know, I, I, was, I was looking at myself as a 12 year old and all the questions that you have at that time. Um, and then how I was searching for answers. And I think this uh, piece, as it starts with writing letters, it is about a call out to mm -hmm. uh, someone to see you in a different way. Um, it's, a, it's a way that you can communicate um, you know, the deepest thoughts and feelings and in a sense of anonymity, but it also um, right. is the most intimate part of you. Um, and so there's a safety in that, that you can cast a letter away and um, who knows what the, you don't have to bear the reaction. Yeah, there's <laughs> also like this time capsule about it. And, I, and, and Melody acknowledges this, like in the very beginning about like how it's different. I, I think it, maybe another character, but I, there, there are lines in the play about how it's different than an email because it's not just about what you're writing. It's the fact that another human being touched that piece of paper, wrote in their handwriting and something, I mean, we know that something different happens in your brain when you're typing versus when you're writing. Um, so there is something so intimate that just like, I mean, it just crackles off the page. And I also couldn't help but make the connection that like, you know, animals out of paper is all about origami and the folding of paper, but letters of Suresh is all about, you know, passing paper between people and, and letters. It's just, it's so beautiful. Um, may you mention that you're excited to get back to second stage. You've worked at so many places. I mean, your career is incredible in New York Theater Workshop and awards from the League of uh, Professional Women. And, you know, now your position at the Lark. But I know that you mentioned that second stage you really felt was a launch pad for you. Um, in what way and, and how did that early start impact the way you direct now? Yes, I was a Van Leer fellow way back in the day. Um, and it was actually in the first year or so that I moved to New York, um, right before I went to grad school. And um, it was my first time working in, um, you know, a large theater. Um, and so it opened my eyes to um, just uh, how, uh, how theater worked. I was able to assist greats like uh, Mary Zimmerman. Um, and so it opened up so much of that. But the, the thing that was transformative was that um, Carol and Chris Burney, uh, the Associate Artistic Director at the time, they encouraged me to go after this dream project that I had been thinking about. Um, and I really wanted to do a, a, a large piece that was focused on the immigrant experience. Um, and it, I reached out to several different writers, I think uh, 10, or, 10 or 12, um, and that, that we're all focused on immigration issues. And then I did 
this piece um, that, uh, you know, en encompassed all the things that I love, really rigorous, vibrant, bold work about pushing boundaries stylistically and also thematically and changing the narrative of what um, you know, the immigrant experience had been represented as. Um, and uh, that project and the mentorship that I received from Second Stage, it really shaped um, how the, the artist I eventually became, which was still pursuing those questions. Um, and I really credit it for, for setting me on this path. Mm. Just, I mean, in terms of critical thinking and the way you think about things, it's, it, it's, huge when you have those early influences. Rajiv, you have kind of made second stage a little home for yourself between, you know, starting with all this intimacy, animals out of paper, gruesome playground injuries, you know, coming back now. What keeps you coming back to second stage? <laughs> I love second stage. Um, the fact that they keep having me back is what keeps me back. <laughs> um, well, they're smart people. <laughs> they have been. Um, you know, the, the most, the, the theater that's been the most, in New York theater has been the most devoted to me in my career since it began. And I particularly think about my play, All This Intimacy, um, which is not a play I like to think about so much anymore, um, but is uh, when I wrote it, uh, Chris Burney and, and Carol Rothman read it and, um, and immediately, um, you know, invested a lot of faith in me. And, uh, and soon after commissioned me with the Time Warner uh, Commission that led to Animals Out of Paper and immediately put both those plays up as, you know, they, they, they committed to those plays very early on. Mm. Um, again, Kazal, Theater of Town. And, you know, those experiences uh, were really instrumental in my development as a writer. And, um, and then a few years later, they brought gruesome playground injuries to the, uh, the Kaiser Theater. Kaiser Theater. Um, and that, um, and that was sort of a dream come true for me at that point because I had had the two shows in the smaller theater uh, uptown, and now I was so excited to be, you know, at that point, which was like, you know, their main stage, and you know, um, right. now, there's, now there's just one stage left for me to get to, so um, we'll have to see what happens. Good now. goals. I have a feeling we'll see you there at the Hayes. <laughs> <laughs> We're putting it out there right now. Yes, please. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um, Two weeks ago, when we had a second stream with Alexis Shear and Roberto Aguirre Sacasa, we talked a lot about violence on stage. And May, there was something that you were saying about what happens to you when you read Rajiv's writing. And, and sometimes there is violence and sometimes it's more what I see is like this gorgeous encapsulation of, of pain like you were talking about the grief and things like that. How do you go about realizing that? Like what start, what do you start to see in your mind's eye to manifest those emotions in real life? Um, well, one of the conversations I had with Rajiv in, in uh, prepping for this play, um, he, he said to me that, he wants people to feel uh, when they experience this play, the way he feels when he's walking through a Tory arch, um, which was his experience in um, Japan, which he can expound upon. Um, but a Tory arch, you know, is a passageway. When you walk through it, you are to take, um, you know, you are taking a journey. Um, and that, transformation, I think that 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 sentiment actually influenced a lot with the design um, in terms of how uh, the characters, um, you know, how they travel through the space and what that architecture around it looks like. Um, I won't reveal too much and also uh, because we haven't gotten our design approved. <laughs> I can't make any promises. No, but here's your um, but it does... to validate why you need it. Make your case, May. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I, I did want, um, you know, we, 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 we talked a lot about in terms of building the world of the play, that the letters are, um, you know, they, they uh, we don't want to take them literally. They are written um, in, uh, you know, to reveal some of the deepest part of, 
uh, their emotionality and their emotional landscape. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was thinking about the world of this play, I, I think about, you know, where each of these characters are in that one particular moment. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning like, are they uh, living within anger? Where are they living within uh, loss? And what exactly does that look like? Um, if I were to, you know, build a sculpture. Um, and so that kind of, um, uh, I guess that, that's how I sort of translate it in 3D in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and then I very clumsily try to communicate that to my brilliant design team. <laughs> And they and they take a lot of my um, ideas and they they put it into form. And, and we did talk a lot about just the element of of, of folding and origami and that um, you know one of the uh, salient themes in animals out of paper um, is you know once you fold a piece of paper you know there's always a crease and you're always going to um, uh, see the, the memory that it makes or yeah. feel to experience the memory that it makes. And so um, that, that, that uh, imagery also played a lot into what we were imagining. Yeah, I think there's a misconception because anyone who grows up in theater, you get handed a script and then the director takes that and, you know, interprets what is already there. So I think there's a misconception about like the exchange that happens with a new play between playwright and director. And I'd love to get inside that a bit more and understand like, so this is what's happening for you, May, when you're thinking about, you know, putting this in 3D, but Rajiv, what's happening for you when you're writing it? Like, you, you know, she mentioned the, the Tory arch. Like, what else are you seeing and visualizing as you wrote letters of Suresh? Um, you know, every play is different for me, and some plays I I write with a with a very specific vision for how it should look on stage, and some plays mm -hmm. I, I ignore that entirely, um, not by even by choice, but it's just the, the way that it comes out of me, you know. And so, mm -hmm. in the case of this play, like I don't think I had much of a concept of um, how this would look on stage. I was, I was very conscious of, like, of, of a fear I have with every play I write, which is that I'm gonna bore the audience to tears, you know? And then that, that, that fear was, is enhanced by the format or the sort of structure or the presentation of this in which we are talking about essentially a monologue play, um, yes. which uh, generally I don't enjoy. And so I'm like, well, how am I going to take this type of play and make it, um, you know, urgent and make it uh, make it unfold in a mysterious and interesting and compelling way that 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 would that that would hopefully you know provide a sort of experience for the audience where they don't want to look away. You know, they don't yeah. want to look at their programs. They don't want to look at their phones or their watches. They're like, you know, totally engaged. And um, and then that's why. I actually am so pleased to be working with May and the incredible designers that she's assembled because um, what what they're doing is they're they're helping a lot in that in that regard. I mean they're 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 creating a really gorgeous lens for this play. Yeah, um, and so that's and that's really exciting to me. And I think that like because in the in the course of of writing it, it was I I, I was I was kind of. Um, feeling my way through with my eyes closed in terms of design and, and presentation. So it's exactly what I was going to ask you because with a monologue play with, especially because sometimes when we see plays with letters, you know, love letters or a daddy long legs or something like that, there's a back and forth. And the way you're writing is, you know, one person writes many letters and we know there are responses or the lack thereof, but you, you see one side to both of you, like how have you been finding that you create tension, that you create momentum? Um, does it have to be worked out in the room or are there things that you have been doing now in conversation that you think have offered that? I, I mean, I think that uh, we, we think about that question a lot, like how to keep the uh, momentum moving forward and how to, um, you know what I, 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 um, 
you know, one of one of the images that really permeates the piece is the image of water and water as it is can be very, very calm and it can be uh, very, very still and it can also be the most violent, um, uh, you know, element, uh, you know, on earth. And, and so uh, that movement of how it goes from being very still and then also being at, at its most raucous is something that I am uh, trying to do with the space so that it always feels, so that the emotional life of what the characters are going through is really, um, it, it's expressed in the, uh, the world changes as their emotions change. Yeah. Um, hmm. And so we think about how we can do that practically, um, you know, uh, in, uh, in the theater um, and how, um, uh, you know, while, while still uh, really centering on the actor's journey. Um, one of the things that makes that forward momentum easy is that the, the, the letters are also compelling. Yes. And then, and uh, I think Rishi puts a lot of trust in actors. He gives them a lot of room and beautiful playgrounds to, to explore within. <laughs> and I think that uh, this play has no exception. Um, and there is a, there's a, um, it, it really is about the actors moving us forward. Mm. I mean, the way you're speaking about this, if the people out there listening aren't excited to see it, I don't know what else to say because having, re having read the play and knowing what happens, I still need to now see what happens. Um, and we are keeping spoilers under wraps as much as we are talking about this. Um, you know, I, I did notice, Rajiv, in a lot of your plays, at least the ones I've read and the ones that have been at Second Stage, they are very intimate stories. You know, um, Animals was a, was a three-person play. Gruesome Playground Injuries is a two-hander. What compels you to, to write intimately? Or, or what do you enjoy about the small um, close-up to characters like that? Yeah, I mean, I th I think that like with with plays, you learn early on that like it's you know there every character has to earn their way into a a, a story and and no one um, like there there are no small characters right and so like you you have to um, a, a lot of times and this this play started off with a larger cast than it has mm -hmm. and you know, I sometimes compare it to like a a startup company where like. You have to hire a lot of people to get it off the ground, but then at a certain point, you're like, "Hey, you know, it's it's been great, but um, we're, we're we're doing some corporate restructuring here, and we're gonna have to let you go, and um, you're gonna be an offstage character. We're gonna mention your name, but you're not gonna be here uh, in the long run." And so that happens quite a quite a bit. Um, so I'm always, I think, trying to get to the the the, the most elemental uh, place with with everything, with action, with character. But that that often lends itself to smaller casts, um, and then as it pertains to two-person plays, of which I have um, now written four, um, and that's probably the you know that that's probably the, the, the most common play I've written now is, is a two-hander. That's not this. Um, I think that two-handers are fun, and I think that they're like uh, really fun to write and really fun to watch. And um, and really hard for actors to do, um, but I do enjoy right. it quite a bit. I think that's my for me personally. It's like um, I call them like the motorcycles of plays. Like they're mm. Mm. I am curious, and whether you want to answer this about letters or leave a little bit more mystery, but like who who did you cut? Who have we let go? And if you'd rather use a different play as an example, I'd love to know who used to be there, why they had to be there, and then what, at what point you knew they, they couldn't anymore. Well, this play, um, Letters of Suresh, uh, did not used to be entirely in this kind of um, epistolary format. You know, it used to have a much more kind of uh, conventional structure that was punctuated with Suresh's letters. Um, but it was a story about Melody and her uh, boyfriend and her boyfriend's sister um, were the kind of main characters of the play. Mm -hmm. And and then Suresh was this kind of mysterious figure on the periphery. And um, I hated this play. 
um, it was a really bad play. And I remember I was having dinner with Chris Burney. This is when he still was working at Second Stage. And Chris has a very um, effective way of, of reaching my, uh, <laughs> the, the, what, what needs to be reached with me in terms of like when I'm struggling with a work. And he's, his, his guidance on uh, Animal at a Paper and All This Intimacy and Gruesome Playground Injuries formed um, those plays, like mm. um, really helped me get to the, to, the, to the elemental place of them. And he just simply asked, he's like, what do you like about the play? And I said, all I like are the letters. He's like, so just write letters. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll try that. And that's what led to this. And uh, I'm always very, um, uh, I have a lot of gratitude for Chris for that. That is, see, I mean, it truly takes a village, but it's also just so wild to hear, you know, first draft to 10th draft kind of thing. And like how much things truly change Speaking of which, I'm wondering in this downtime, in this extra time, um, what if anything have the two of you been changing together? I know that a lot of times, you know, artists will say, well, opening night happens and that's, you know, that's when you stop working is when you have to, is when the pencils down moment comes. But what happens when that pencils down moment gets extended? Do you like, do you find yourself tempted to keep tinkering and is the tinkering useful or do you have to sit on your hands? Like, what are the conversations going on between the two of you? Well, one thing that just happened in the world really is that COVID hit and this play I, I can't think of a more perfect play to come back from the pandemic with because it really does, it, it deals with the feeling of isolation and and, uh, and trying to find connection um, and uh, the importance of um, reaching out. And so I, I get emotional actually thinking about uh, what it's going to mean to an audience coming back from not having uh, connected in a in a in live theater uh, to witness this play, and I think it's going to be a really powerful thing. And so I think as our as the world has changed and how we are um, inhabiting it, and how we are uh, really struggling to find connection and to to um, uh, uh, to reach one another, uh, I, I think is really informed at least my interpretation of it as a director. It's gotten much deeper and much more profound. Um, so that that I think is is actually a um, I'm it's 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 a blessing really um, to have the additional time to work on it because I think it's it's enriched. Hmm. What would you say, Rajiv? I mean, you asked if I was tinkering. Like tinkering is not the word. <laughs> um, I'm I'm rewriting the play constantly, and um, and I'm still getting to uh, that elemental place with it. Uh, it is parts of it I think work very well. Parts of it I think do not work very well. This is not abnormal for me I, uh, at this stage in the game. Obviously, this would have been produced already, and I would have gone through a much more intense run up to it at the time. Mm -hmm. we've, been, we've been given a lot of time, as everyone has this past year. But um, I, I've taken that time to really, uh, you know, recoil from the from the play a little bit, come back to it, and continue to work. So you feel like you're getting closer and closer. I know sometimes just as a journalist, like when I rewrite, sometimes it's like, now you're getting, now you're driving yourself crazy. You're getting too far from it, but you feel like you're being able to drill down is what it sounds like. Well, both. I mean, I, I've taken some steps backwards with rewrites, but um, <laughs> I oftentimes do that. Like, I oftentimes take kind of wild stabs in the dark, especially if I'm, if I'm struggling with something. I will say, okay, in this draft, I'm going to do this wild and crazy thing. I know it's not going to work, but I'm just going to see how it feels. And mm. and then usually, I it it doesn't work, but it 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 illuminates something about the play that I had not yet seen. So the note inside the note. Yes, exactly. And so when I the last draft I've done, I did of this play had a lot of stuff that I I don't think works, but I wanted to see how it flew in the in the in the reading of it, and that's helped inform this rewrite I'm working on now. Hmm. Can you give me either both of you an example of 
a conversation that you had about the play where, I don't know, one of you asked the other a question that led to a new discovery? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of a specific thing that would be helpful, but I think that, you know, May and I have, um, especially in the last couple months, have Zoomed a lot um, and talked about the play, talked about the design, and the design informs the play and vice versa, you know? And um, we've talked a lot about, um, just we've talked a lot about how, um, how my desire for this play is that it, it is in some ways, like I think my, my, my ultimate desire is that it's that the experience of the play, like May said, is like a, a walk through these Tory arches, a visit to a shrine. It is a quiet play. It is a play that like hopefully um, promotes contemplation, right? But uh, on the other hand, I, that's not enough. I want the play also to be a mystery. I want it to unfold in a way that is. Um, this is this is the motor of it. This is this is the why you can't look away. This is the why I want to know what happens next. It's not simply oh I'm going to go sit in this beautiful place and contemplate. Um, that's not really what what plays are you know are solely for. There's there has to be more to it. And yeah. So that's because um, because you know you know not everyone wants to go contemplate you know so but but hopefully everybody wants a story told to them and that's why they're in the theater so yeah. um that's 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 what i'm that's what i'm driving at and what um i'm still struggling with because that's hard you know i have such a great respect for the great mystery writers of the world you know um that write you know books that you read on the beach that um that are page turners because what they're doing is 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 you know gripping you within a, a, a tale that is um, impossible to put down. Yeah, the, the ability to create a constant curiosity is right. That the thing that moves you forward is you have to know, while also revealing at the same time. Right, like you have to reveal enough that you're learning things, but also continue to entice people that they're oh there's something more to be revealed. It's yes. a really, it's a crazy tightrope to walk. I don't envy you, but <laughs> but I think you're doing really well with it. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, I was reading an interview that you did, Rajiv, about guards at the Taj, and you said in an interview that you were finding historical stories easier to write. And I'm wondering, it seems so, but is that still true for you? And And why? Why historical stories? So I, I had a play a few years ago at the Vineyard Theater um, downtown that was called The North Pool. Mm -hmm. And um, and The North Pool took me a long time to write. It, and it, it's a two-hander and it's a mystery and it's a kind of a thriller of a play. And I started writing that play, I think in like 2005 maybe. And, and then it went up on in like 2013. So it was like a long process. Um, and I kept having to rewrite that play because some the early part of the play hinged on a cell phone. And the cell phone technology of our time kept changing dramatically every year. Wow. And, and I realized that finally when it went up, I was like, this play will be so dated in just a couple of years because this technology will again advance. And I realized how much technology is part of our lives right now. And if especially if you are creating a story in which technology is part of the actual plot, uh, a plot device in the story, um, it's going to feel somewhat dated after a couple of years. And so I wondered, so I, I was drawn to like writing stories that took place in the past because I was like, it's a fixed state, you know? Um, it's supposed to be in the past. They don't have any cell phones. They don't have any computers. And so, um, but there were other things that drew me to that because like the, I have written different types of historical plays and Gods of the Taj, is you know barely a historical play. It takes place in the 1640s and uh, in India, but it's it's a very heightened kind of tale, and it's right. it, it would be it would be false to call it historical because there's there's not there's not a lot of to sort of learn from it. And then you know I've written a play called Describe the Night, which um, also takes place over the course of 90 years in Russia and Poland Polish history and um, a lot of there is a lot of history in that play but there's also a lot of um, storytelling and part of the trick of that play is 
that the characters and the audience are always wondering what is true and what is not true. And so there's a, it's, it's playing more on the concept of how history is written and expressed and transmitted rather than this is a history lesson. So basically you tackle really easy things. And when you say a historical story is easier for you to write, everybody take that as relative. <laughs> I mean, May, I'm wondering for you, you know, I, I read your story about um, being, you know, so drawn to social justice, thinking that you were going to be in social work or law and thinking that directing in theater was going to be more of a, more of a side gig. Surprise, surprise. It's not. Um, I'm wondering, like, if you feel that this play feeds that same thirst in you or if this because it's more about individual connection um it's a bit of a palate cleanser for you in that way like where does it fit in for your sensibilities oh um that, that's a good question i mean i think that um I think it all, all political action really relates to the personal and how you can be um you know, a, a whole human being that is, um, you know, interconnected uh, with society and social change is it's uh, that 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 feeds into the the um, social changes. Mm -hmm. um, I think with this play, it is much more about looking inward. Um, uh, you know. There's so many moments of recognition that I have when I read this play, um, even though um, I don't have that much in common with any of the characters, you know. Uh, um, uh, but but the feelings that they undergo, I deeply understand, and they resonate with me. And I think when you find that recognition and you recognize that someone else is also going through that, that's what's that's very validating for yourself. Um, and I think with this play, seeing uh, an Asian woman, you know, um, open up the play that is magnified for me even more um, because I can see myself as her. And I also just recognize so many of the um, uh, feelings that she's experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, and in that way, I feel uh, when you when you see that recognition, it does um, all right, sorry, when you when you have that moment of recognition, mm -hmm. you um, I, I, I think it makes you feel much more of a whole person and able to um, to to sort of better exist in the world. You know, I think that in, in, a, in a very um, uh, loose way is how you become um, a much more empathetic uh, citizen. Do you feel like you need to recognize something in the characters in a work in order to take it on? Um, yes and no. Uh, oftentimes, uh, I, I I don't know. I, I, I feel like my life's work is just to, to um, probe at all of the widest corners of my imagination and in my being. Um, you know, all of us as humans, we, we encompass so much experience. We are, um, every day we are changing and, and um, influenced by the world around us. Um, and in that way, I, I, and that's, that's why theater is such an important vehicle, I think, for social change is that it is, um, that there are so many different, you can walk in so many very, so many people's shoes. Um, just because the, the human being is so multifaceted. Um, uh, you know, for me, um, I, I like, um, I want to see more Asian stories on stage. I want to see more um, Asian characters on stage. Um, and particularly in this moment right now when we are dealing with so much um, anti-Asian-ness and um, hate crimes with Asians. And I think that uh, seeing yourself on stage as an Asian woman is very empowering um, for the next generation and this generation who haven't seen it before. Yeah. I mean, you know, you mentioned seeing that kind of character on stage and I actually, 
I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love so much when people are able to tell their own stories because for so long they have not been able to, but I do find it also powerful that Rajiv, like you as first of all, a man are inhabiting, you know, which you do all the time, inhabiting a, a female character, um, that your heritage is different from the heritage, the heritages of some of the characters that are on stage how do you go about, like, are you just going to like, well, here are all the human things that we all have in common, or are you broadly researching culture to then strip that away to, to the humanness? Like what's your research process like in terms of identifying with the people you're writing? It depends. I mean, I, I, I start off you know, with um, some some notion of who I want to see in, in this story and who's important to me in this story, and um, it 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 felt you know I, I I knew that this story was you know going to kind of revolve around Japan, you know, okay. and and so I it, it made sense to me that there would be a Japanese character, um, and uh, the, and then, but as Melody, you know, the character developed, um, I discovered more and more about her that I didn't know at first. And that, you know, she's a she's an Asian American woman. She grew up in the United States. She hasn't been to Japan until this play. Um, she is actually half Japanese and half Korean, um, and she is. And so, the, and then these kind of things brought me closer to her. And you know, you you start to kind of. Um, Form a relationship with the, with you know with the people and because I had formed such a tight relationship with Suresh ten years ago. I it led me to this play. Suresh and I somewhat share an ethnic uh, you know similarity to a degree. I'm half Indian. He is um, his both of his parents are Indian, but we both grew up in the United States. And at, right. after that, there's like very little similarity between he and I. I feel like I have a lot more in common with Melody than I do with Suresh. Suresh is a genius, um, a mathematical genius at that. So I mean like, um, and origami. So I, I, uh, I, I, I'm fascinated with him, but I don't, I, I find him more impenetrable than Melody, for example. Yeah. Um, and so, and that's like going back to what May said is like kind of finding these kind of common, um, you know, humanistic things that, that that we all share, as long as you're kind of careful enough to, you know, um, explore them and address them. Yeah, it actually, I, I was wondering about Suresh because um, when reading some interviews around animals out of paper, um, I don't know if you remember saying this, but that you had been, you had been wanting to write a young prodigy play um, and I thought it was so interesting because even at that time you were like, and chess has been done. So I was looking for the prodigy thing and like, here we are in the queen's gambit mode and everybody's like chess again. But I found it really interesting that like, you know, you end up on a greyhound next to a woman folding paper and then suddenly you found your prodigy. But what is it about the prodigy that captured you to begin with and seems to continue to capture you as, as you bring this character back? I mean, I think that everyone, we are fascinated with, with people who are geniuses, you know, we're fascinated with people who can do things like without training sometimes that, um, that defy explanation. Um, it's one of the great, um, it's like, it's like a mutation of the human species when someone, uh, especially, and you see it in children because, you know, children have no self-consciousness about them and, and sometimes they just start to do something and they're like wait how did you do that whether it's chess right. or whether it's origami or whether it's playing an instrument or whether it's playing basketball um there are all these different ways that like when it happens and you notice it it's it again it's that you can't look away from it you know and so to have a character like that is always interesting to me yeah and what's interesting to me on top of that is that melody seems to be a character who at least thinks of herself as not being good at very much of anything. So they're a phenomenal foils to each other. Um, we do have some audience questions. There is a question from Gabby for May. As you think about staging the play, have you found yourself taking into account the possibility that protocols 
will continue in terms of COVID into the fall and the spring and pretty much, you know, theater moving forward. So do you think about staging things in terms of COVID safety, not just in terms of the vision of the story? Um, uh, obviously that, that absolutely comes into play. We want everyone to have a safe, um, uh, you know, experience uh, in rehearsing the play and also anyone that comes to see it. Um, and uh, so I'm careful about that. We, we, the vision had to come first and then, um, and, and now we are almost working meticulously through the play to ensure that it is a, a, a safe environment. Um, one thing that is, you know, it makes me a little sad is thinking about um, just the proximity of uh, uh, just actually the culture of a rehearsal hall um, in which you are, you know, you're, you're there together with the cast, you know, you're, um, you know, you're, you're eating together and on the breaks, you know, you're, you're kind of floating in and out fairly freely. I think that's going to be the biggest culture shock going back. Mm -hmm. um, because that's so much a part of, um, you know, the culture of theater is that um, just the fraternity that you experience when you're, um, you know, with one another building something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a question from, again, I don't know how to pronounce their name, if it's Tav or Tave. They asked a question last time, so you have to tell me how to pronounce your name so that we know going forward, but do either of you practice origami yourselves? I, I do not, um, but <laughs> when I was doing my research for, for Animals on a Paper 10 years ago, um, I went to the National Origami Convention at the Fashion Institute of Technology um, downtown, and I met all these origamists who were incredibly instrumental in the writing of that play. And I remember there were these kiddos from MIT who were like kind of the uh, the bullies of the origami set, and uh, they 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 found it delightful that I was writing a play about origami, but I didn't fold, and so they then made me fold something, and they gave me a task where they're like they gave me a square piece of paper that was blue on one side and white on the other, and they said uh, you have to fold this so it becomes a, uh, a checkerboard, you know. Mm -hmm. Yellow square, blue square, yellow square, or white, white square, blue square. And it took me a long time. And they would they would goad me and give me hints, but eventually I did it. And then I earned their respect. <laughs> Look at you. I would not be able to do it, I don't think. I was never good at like Rubik's Cubes. Like that was not the spatial awareness was was not my thing. Um I guess, you know, before if there are other questions, please. Um, absolutely put them in the chat. Um, but before we wrap up, I'll ask, um, you know, like I, like I mentioned before, I, I just find um, that there's just different, you know, types of pain going on in your plays, Rajiv. And I'm wondering, um, this one is the least physical. So was there something about like that emotional pain that you wanted to explore and and what have both of you learned so far from exploring it? Well, if you if I look back on the the sort of genesis of you know what led me here is that 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 photograph of my great uncle. Mm -hmm. um, that's a violence that you know we thankfully haven't seen since, um, and so I think that this. <clears throat> This play exists in the scar of that, mm. and um, and so that's what is um, it's 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 the experience of that day is not um, it's not a, it's not a crucial aspect to the story, but it is it is a it is it is touched upon and is is actually crucial to the to the priest who Suresh befriends because he was there on that day. Yeah, that we don't see it happen, but that it is the root of what's going on. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. May, what about for you? I, I, I think this play is brutal, uh, even if it, they're bearing their scars, even if we're not showing how they Oh, I'm them. not trying to compare physical <laughs> scars with emotional ones. I think that's a heavy battle, but it, it, they, are, they are different in nature. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I think that um, 
in a way it's just more challenging and and I think more rewarding even for an actor to kind of uh, dig into that uh, psychology um, and live with that um, character and the pain they're going through. Yeah. yeah, well, I can't thank you both enough. You have been terrific. This has been so exciting to give people a preview of what's to come. And we know that more things are going to change. So you're all a part of the process. Um, stay tuned for announcements about Letters of Suresh at Second Stage at the Tony Kaiser Theater in Midtown when we all come back to the theater. And in the meantime, you should definitely go back into the archives read Animals Out of Paper if you want, read Gruesome Playground Injuries, read Bengal Tiger at the Baghdad Zoo, go back and, you know, watch, I watched interviews with May about Eclipsed and Viet Gone and um, read the script of Somebody's Daughter, which was at Second Stage by Chisa Hutchinson. So incredible repertoires uh, and catalogs from both of these artists. And I hope um, that it is sooner rather than later that we see you at the theater. So thank you all so much for being here tonight. Thank you to Rajiv and May, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Ruthie. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye.